Hi everyone, welcome to our next installment of Let's Play Stray. The YouTube channel is Automachination. The website is automachination.com for all of your literary needs. Patreon.com slash automachination. If you want to support the work of this channel and the website, support my writing, and also get a bunch of extras, right? Some patron-only exclusives. I have a couple of videos up now. I have a three-hour video of me uh, working on my latest novel and just talking about various things. Um, I have some more stuff that's coming up uh, this week, next week. So the reason why I started these uh, uh, Let's Play videos is I basically just want uh, to attract people that perhaps were or are somewhat like I was when I was younger, right? I had uh, video game addictions. I had food addictions, right? I had all kinds of problems. So I, uh, you know, I, I can empathize and I could also sympathize with people that have, um, oh, I guess I'm going to have to figure out this code later. Not now. Um, you know, I, I, I've been through some of these things and, and one thing that I've realized is uh, the best way to get over something like an addiction to something totally pointless is you got to replace it with something that provides purpose, right? And, and the biggest thing that I recommended to everybody, right, something that, that everybody could do, right? If you're in America, for instance, right, you have access to libraries and library cards, right? It gives you ebooks, it gives you physical books. I recommended that people go out there and start reading. And when I say read, I mean re real books, right? Uh, books that challenge you, books that, that have some level of difficulty. Because if you're watching this video, I'm sure you might understand that over uh, the last couple of decades, people's attention spans have really started to crater, right? I am to an extent one of these people, right? I have to have all these special rules for myself, right? So I could like avoid, uh, so I could avoid, uh, social media so i could avoid like overuse of my phone right i'm not you know much of a gamer anymore like i literally haven't uh, played this game since i posted up the video two weeks ago so I i'm thinking maybe this will be like a way for me to actually like finish a, a game for the first time in a very long time but just generally speaking right people's att attention spans for different reasons have cratered and I, I said reading is a superpower, right? And, and the reason why reading is a superpower is very few people are able to do that, right? Very few people are able to read serious books, right? Even like when you listen to like podcasts or whatever of supposedly like intellectual types, they're like, oh my God, like I have to read an article for this podcast that I'm doing next week. And it's just so hard for me to find the time. It's so hard for me to, you know, sit down and get it done. And of course, you know, you, you, you clearly have a lot of time, right? The, the reason why you can't find the time is because you allow your time to be frittered away, either consciously or unconsciously. So anyway, to kind of go with this theme of uh, um, reading, right, uh, and encouraging you guys to read, I, I think there might be definitely some kids in the audience if you're watching this video. And there's nothing wrong with that. All that means uh, on my end is I'm, I'm going to be a little uh, more sort of circumspect in the words that I use, right? Um, uh, maybe I'm not going to push the envelope too much, right? Uh, this is a, a mostly adult channel, but uh, I want to be cognizant of uh, if I put up a video like this, right? There's going to be kids watching this. So uh, to continue with this theme of reading... Uh, I think a book I recommended uh, you guys read Mark Twain's uh, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. And I mean, it's an excellent book uh, for some of you. It might be too much to start with. It is also a very long book. Um, so I have something else here, right? Kind of like more general interest, right? A lot of people, uh, especially if you're young, they're into existential sort of novels, right? They're into... Um, you know, kind of like figuring things out interpersonally, maybe what's going on in their minds. And I, I thought a great sort of intro for this might be uh, Dostoevsky's uh, uh, Notes from Underground, right? And I, I, I read this uh, for the first time in the last month. And um, so let me, let me like ignore this for now. I, I read it for the first time last month. I read a couple times. And I, I have a bunch of notes here. We're going to go through this you know, pretty much chapter by chapter. We're going to go over some of the themes. We're going to go over some of my impressions artistically and um, in other ways as well. So if you haven't read the book, uh, maybe this video is either going to goad you to do it or maybe you now feel like you should, you know, stop watching the video. Maybe I would even recommend that and, and, go, and go read the text, 
right, before you sort of, you know, even if like like spoilers, right, are not, are not part of it, right? I mean, spoilers is all, it's nonsense, right? But still, I mean, you want to be prepared for the discussion, right? You want to know what I'm talking about and you sort of want to test yourself, your own attention span, see what's going on. Um, so nothing wrong with shutting down this video and doing that first, right? It's not a very long book. You could even listen to the audio book, right? Like if you download LibriVox, uh, uh, on either Android or iPhone, whatever, um, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get audio books, right? For free, right? This is in the public domain, right? It was, it was written in the 1800s. So, um, it, it's, it's easy to get through, right? You could just like take a couple of walks, right? Over a couple of days and while you're doing your chores or whatever, you could, you could get this done, right? So not a big deal. It's easy enough to get it done in that way. So anyway, Dostoevsky's notes from underground, right? Um, so like first thing, uh, just like looking around what people are saying, just like on Wikipedia articles or whatever, um, a lot of people have this like problem with the translation, right, uh, of the title, right? They, they insist that the Russian word, uh, podpolya, uh, means, uh, something other than underground. But I mean, you could translate as underground. Like if you look at, if I look through some of my dictionaries, right? If you look through a lot of online dictionaries, podpolya is, is, is more or less translated as underground, um, what I will say, though, is that th there is a, a word in the center of it, right? If you're a Russian speaker, you would know this pol, right? P, uh, it would be like a P-O-L, right? Um, which means floor, right? So there is something to the critique that we are talking about notes from somebody that is living, let's say, under the floorboards, right? Someone that is not merely uh, shutting himself up somewhere so that he's never seen, but that he's uh, uh, also kind of like spying on you, right? Like watching you, right? Uh, studying you, right? This is someone that at least fancies himself to be very intelligent, right? So he's sort of kind of like watching you from afar, right? And maybe some of you guys, especially if you've got problems in your life, might a little bit uh, uh, kind of like um, see yourself a little bit in this kind of uh, process of maybe you're not ready or you don't want to be part of kind of like the wider world, right? But you are very willing to be a watcher, right? A gazer. So uh, there is something a little bit to those uh, critiques uh, of the translation, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, uh, be uh, too crazy about uh, about that, right? So um, it is considered like one of the first existential novels. Uh, I I would say that in terms of like firsts. Um, Maybe, maybe something like uh, Defoe's uh, Robinson Crusoe. Maybe, maybe is the first existential novel. Maybe like I'm just like missing something. Uh, if I like think back chronologically, right to like who, who was writing what. But when you read uh, uh, something like um, Robinson Crusoe, right, this is a man that gets you know he's a, a shipwrecked, right? He's on an island. And he has to deal with loneliness. He has to deal with aloneness. He has to deal with himself. He has to deal with this budging religiosity. He has to deal with these like secular symbols coming at him that are, you know, like they, they very much uh, might very well in his mind be religious symbols, right? Which is what he's uh, often thinking about there. Um, and that's kind of like a proto-existentialist novel, right? And I would also consider Notes from Underground to be a kind of like proto-existential novel, right? Because it doesn't hit quite the sort of artistic and philosophical heights that some of the best existential writing hits, let's say, in the 1900s, right? Uh, to me, um, uh, something like Herman Hesse's uh, Steppenwolf, right? Which, by the way, guys, uh, I do have uh, an artifact podcast Right, I, I run this podcast, and you could see this video that I did a few months ago on Steppenwolf. Right, it's a great uh, German text from I believe it's like 1926, 1929, something like that. And I, I consider that a far more developed book. Right, I'm going to get into some of the reasons why, but there's nothing wrong with starting from Notes from Underground. Again, it's it's easier to understand, it's easier to get through, and also throws enough ideas at you that you could start to you could start to play with them, right? It could be kind of like a, an initial introduction to philosophy, right? Um, it, it, so it, another thing that I would compare it to, I have in notes here, right? Uh, Newt Hampson's Hunger is probably closer in quality to uh, uh, Notes from Underground than Notes of Underground is in, 
you know, to something like Steppenwolf, right? If you read uh, Newt Hampson, um, Dan Schneider uh, doesn't really uh, think uh, much of the poet and translator Robert Bly, but I think Robert Bly's translation of Hunger is the best transla translation that I've read, right? It retains like a whole lot of humor that I haven't seen in other translations, right? I remember I would sort of uh, put them side by side and I was like laughing out loud at a lot of stuff that happened in Hunger, right? And I, I had really no effects, uh, uh, um, you know, one way or the other through some other translation. So, um, but to, to get back to specifically this book, the, ba the, the basic thrust is, or rather the idea is Dostoevsky, right? He, he reads uh, this book, What is to be Done, by this uh, other Russian writer called uh, Nikolai uh, Chernyshevsky. And it's like this is supposed to be this kind of like utopian socialist text where, you know, the world becomes, uh, you know, it, it, it suddenly becomes more uh, logical over time, right? Once you establish a utopia, you could get this crystal of palace, right? Um, or rather, the, this, this palace of crystal, right, is the way that he often phrases it in the book. And by becoming more and more logical over time, you could do away with, you know, some of the kind of like worse externalities that human beings have to deal with. And Dostoevsky, allegedly, he was like absolutely fuming that someone could write a book that was so kind of like outside of uh, or, or rather like not not truly grappling with with human psychology, right, with like uh, the so-called human question. So he wrote this book as a response. And, and what's interesting to me is whether or not this is true of Dostoevsky and his kind of like feelings about uh, this, this uh, what is to be done text. Um, there's a lot in Notes from Underground that undermines whatever is sort of like said about e either Dostoevsky's argument or maybe the argument that, that Dostoevsky himself thinks that he's making, but especially uh, the argument that the narrator in the book thinks that he's making, right? Because we have to draw those distinctions, right? It's not merely about what the writer uh, is doing or is thinking, right? There's also another layer, right? The most important layer, the only layer, you know, worth even talking about really is what's going on uh, in a line by line, paragraph by paragraph, page by page basis in the text itself, right? So, um, uh, 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 like another question I want to talk about is like, what, if there are some intellectual weak spots in the text, right? Uh, to the extent that perhaps we could even call them intellectual weak spots, right? Again, it's, there's a there's a distinction we have to draw between Dostoevsky and the narrator. Right. But uh, one thing I want to ask is, does it does it harm right or, or hinder the book in any way? Right. Does it harm the artistry? Right. Uh, if you can't um, quite be, let's say, intellectually consistent. Right. So we're going to adjudicate that question. And um, we're going to go through again, chapter by chapter. So just just to sort of like give you the basic thrust before I go into these chapters. So there's an unnamed narrator. Um, and he is uh, presently now about 40 or perhaps slightly past the age of 40. And he's, he's living in this like little spot in St. Petersburg, right? And he's living in this, uh, he has like a, he's inherited some money, right? So he decides to like essentially, you know, give up his job. Uh, he, he was working as a civil servant, hire a, a new servant right because he seems to have this other servant uh, later on because right? the book does not go chronologically and um just kind of like live off of uh, uh this money that he has right very frugally right um which explains like some of the stinginess that you see and some of his kind of complexes about money right because he decides he does, doesn't want to work he just wants to live off of this inheritance and he he begins the book right the first the first uh part right it's divided into two parts and the first part is he's looking back on his life specifically into his uh, uh early mid 20s when the book's like action takes place and the but the first half is just kind of like almost purely philosophical right he talks about himself he talks about his problems he talks about his disconnect from the world Right. He talks about the fact that uh, he, he feels cowardly or he is cowardly. He can't uh, uh, do much that's worthwhile. Right. Uh, he on the one hand says that he's spiteful and then he says, no, I'm not spiteful. He says that he's lazy, but no, I'm not lazy. Laziness, laziness is not the reason why I, I do essentially nothing in life. Right. 
So uh, he's building out this kind of like, you know, it, you know, in that existential sense, right? He's building out this character in the first part. And then you sort of see in the second part how maybe perhaps some of, the, some of this came to be, right? How he engages, uh, you know, in the human side of things um, and, and the kind of interactions that he has. I, I do believe that the first part of the book is uh, much stronger than the second part. Right, second part has like melodrama and other, and other things that are not even necessarily that well written, you know, like sentence by sentence. Although there's still some good artistry there that I'm going to talk about, right? Some of the artistic choices that Dostoevsky makes, right, are 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 interesting, right? So, chapter one, uh, it's it's essentially kind of like from from spite to stasis, right? And I'm going to read this in two ways. I'm going to, on the one hand. Uh, give you the English, and then I'm going to read it to you, the first paragraph to you guys uh, in Russian, right? Because uh, I, I read some, you know, uh, like artistic criticism here where they refer to the Russian, and I'm going to respond to some of the claims being made, and I'll give you a sense of like what it sounds like and and, and my own sort of impressions of this. So uh, the English opening paragraph is like this. I believe this is the Constance uh, Garnet uh, translation. I am a sick man. I am a spiteful man. I am an unattractive man. I believe my liver is diseased. However, I know nothing at all about my disease and do not know for certain what ails me. I don't consult a doctor for it and never have, though I have a respect for medicine and doctors. Besides, I am extremely superstitious, sufficiently so to respect medicine anyway. I am well educated enough not to be superstitious, but I am superstitious. No, I refuse to consult a doctor from spite that you probably will not understand. Well, I understand it, though. Of course, I can't explain who it is precisely that I am mortifying in this case by my spite. I am perfectly well aware that I cannot pay out the doctors by not consulting them. I know better than anyone that by all this I am only injuring myself and no one else. But still, if I don't consult a doctor, it is from spite. My liver is bad. Well, let it get worse. Right. So it, it is a kind of like a novel way to start a book. Right. Uh, immediately, like if you think about it, like you, you do want to read further. Right? But it's not in this kind of like plot driven way. Right. Uh, you want to figure out what it is about this character that makes him have, you know, like multiple contradictions and how uh, he resolves them in, in any way. Right. If he does end up resolving them. Right. So this is a this is a good intro right and, and like i said earlier right the first part is is fairly strong even if again just uh, intellectually there there are things that i could uh talk about and uh uh you know either criticize or even sometimes though i'm gonna try not to nitpick right i'm not a nitpicker right i want to give like a full kind of scope view of things but anyway so that's the english and this is how how the russian sounds like and i want you to just pay attention to the sound like even if you're you know not going to understand the words just just pay attention to я человек больной, я злой человек. Непривлекательный я человек. Я думаю, что у меня болит печень. Впрочем, я не шиша ни смыслю в моей болезни и не знаю, наверное, что у меня болит. Я не лечусь и никогда не лечился, хотя медицину и докторов уважаю. К тому же я еще и суверен до крайности. Ну, хоть настолько, чтобы уважать медицину. Я достаточно образован, чтобы не быть суверенным, но я суверен. Нет, я не хочу лечиться со злости. Вот этого, наверное, не изволите понимать. Ну, а я понимаю. Я, разумеется, не сумею вам объяснить, кому именно я насолю в этом случае моей злостью. Я отлично хорошо знаю, что и, док и докторам и никак не смогу нагодить тем, что у них не лечись. Я лучше всякого знаю, что всем этим я единственно только себе поврежу и никому больше. Но все-таки, если я не лечусь, так это со злости. Печенка болит. And the reason why I wanted to give you guys some of the Russian is uh, I was also listening to this book uh, in, you know, in, in Russian. And I, one thing that I appreciated that they did was 
they essentially just kind of like they had this like old man read the text right which is an interesting choice because the the guy the text uh, as he's uh, narrating he's supposed to be like around 40 years old right but you know like spiritually you could tell like something about this guy has has truly aged right so i thought it was an interesting choice to get like an old man to sort of give you that 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 sense of all that right so um uh, the, the 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 basic thrust of all of this is i mean he he's bored right he he doesn't know you know like what to do with himself right he got a bunch of this money right he's always wanted to be sort of disconnected from the world and guess what now finally he could be disconnected from the world right maybe he's going to have to live a frugal existence but he could be as disconnected uh, as he wants right and and one thing that um, is, is sort of interesting here is like he, he is talking about stuff like like St. Petersburg, right? So he's living in St. Petersburg and he's talking about it being like this intentional city, right? Um, and, and he says some cities are intentional and some cities are not intentional. And the way that I took it was like in the most kind of literal sense, I guess, uh, if you know, like the history of St. Petersburg, right? It was kind of like, you know, it was kind of like it was like a bunch of bogs right over the river uh, Neva, right? And uh, uh, P- Peter the Great was essentially like, you know, I want this to be a city, right? And I want it to be different than the rest of Russia, right? If you look at St. Petersburg now, right? Uh, not that any of you should travel to Russia now, but uh, if, if you look at Google Maps, right? And you decide to go for a walk, right? I do this all the time. I would strongly recommend it. Like pick a city like St. Petersburg and take a walk through it on Google Maps, right? You'll see that it's it's vibes right are very, are very different from the rest of russia if you compare it to even a, a place like moscow right and and i mean there's a reason for it right it, it was very intentionally done and that was sort of like the sense even back then right um and so uh but you know uh, uh beyond that like what, what else could it mean to, to be like an intentional city right there might be also a kind of like paranoia involved like what like what exactly is happening right here that is making um you know him him feel that you know maybe like the city is sort of like out to do something to, to him that that he does that that you know he's sort of like against right he's already sort of paranoid about everything else in the world right in, in that way so um uh, uh he has this like uh, line right uh i could not even become an insect right there was nothing to change into right uh, the consciousness is personal consciousness of like degradation right and this enjoyment of despair right and, and i want to ask this especially if people watching this video if you if you came across this because you're watching the first video about uh, about stray and and, and you know uh, addiction um like do, do do you enjoy that part of yourself right do you enjoy uh that part of you that has the addiction, right? And that's kind of like a very real thing, right? Because I mean, when I was younger, I definitely did enjoy that disconnect, right? It was it was very much a comfortable refuge. A lot of people that have depression, a lot of people that have um, uh, feelings of being disconnected from the world, um, you know, obviously it's a bad thing or they could even complain about it. But, you know, another part of it is they might very well feel in a lot of these cases that it's actually quite comforting, right? Um, some people might very well be choosing a kind of depression or a kind of disconnect because the pain of the alternative or the pain of non-addiction, it could be just as scary, right? If you're not an addict, right, well, suddenly you have to face a, a whole lot of the world, right? Suddenly you have to deal with things that are, are, are much more difficult. Suddenly uh, you have to live your life to the f- fullest. And a lot of people, right, they might not want to live life to the fullest, right uh, however you know however they they choose to define that oh so this is like i guess another uh kind of like a a permanent wall right let's call it stone wall right this becomes uh, important in the book later um so i came from up there and i guess i can't jump down there now um let's see can i knock this over damn i want to knock that bottle off maybe i could drink some of that wine and get my little kitty drunk Hopefully. What is this on the radar? Is it hot? Is it off? Is it on? Anyway, um, all right. And he has this other line. People do pride themselves on their diseases. And that's absolutely true. Like even like to get back to Mark Twain for a little bit, uh, Mark Twain uh, in his essays, he has uh, this uh, one, you get like the collected essays of Mark Twain. 
And he has this one very funny essay that he did where he visits some sort of like, I forget what they were called, but it was like, it, it was like meant to like recuperate, right? It was meant to like, for people that are unwell to become well again. And it would be like taking like, a, 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 you know, baths and these kind of like special, you know, bits of water or whatever. Right. Um, and, and uh, he, uh, you know, he's like sitting with, with all these guys that are like talking about their own sicknesses and the, you know, in this funny way, he describes them as like taking pride in, in the problems that they feel right um taking pride in what ails them and again like ask yourself if you're watching this are you know do this is a very human thing right there, there's nothing wrong to make that kind of admission right um you, you see this like if you're into politics or whatever if you're into the culture wars i mean you see lots of people now in this kind of like nietzsche and kind of like slave morality right uh they're they're, they're, they're trying to sort of take the problems that they have in life, which which is like either like personal, like actual physical debilitating diseases or like anything. And they're trying to sort of turn them around as like a means of like hammering other people over the head with what ails them, right? Um, so uh, the fact that this observation was being made in Russia simultaneously that it was being made uh, uh, elsewhere, right? By Mark Twain and probably others, right? It, it, it shows you how art does sort of come to realizations about the world you know, more or less kind of like around the same time before before it's become kind of like mainstream, right? People are so shocked today, like, oh my goodness, look look, look at uh, what the culture wars are like. Look at how people are using their own personal issues. But I mean, look, this was this was seen a long time ago. Like, There's nothing actually really new. And one thing I want to talk about that I didn't uh, mention, so back in the first chapter, right? Um, he, he's had to exchange servants, right? Later on, you realize why, right? Because he mistreats his servants. Right, even the first servant that he talks about, right, he he says how a stinky, right, his uh, woman servant is now, um, and uh, what I would ask is like he he starts to talk about his upbringing later on. You don't actually know what, what transpired in his life, but he complains about his childhood, and I I do wonder though to what extent can his childhood truly be horrible, right, to explain why he becomes the way that he becomes. If he's able to, let's say, get um, 6,000 rubles, which I guess at the time was like at least enough, right, to make him live 15 years without having to work, right? Um, how terrible could that upbringing really be if he had some means of like not falling through the cracks, right? He chooses, that's the thing, like that's the important part, right? He chooses to fall through the cracks, right? Dost Dostoevsky is, you know, he's intelligently putting these little clues for you without even dwelling on them. He's not dwelling on the 6,000 rubles. He sort of, he puts it out there and he makes his unnamed narrator talk about this childhood just a little bit, just like a couple of sentences like, oh yeah, I hated it. Like it was this, it was that. But uh, you you have to sort of read between the lines and, and, and draw these kinds of conclusions, right? So he places blame upon himself, right? Because he says, I'm cleverer than everyone around me. Right. Um, and he, he kind of hates that about himself. The fact that he views himself as intelligently as he does. Right. And yet he's also too weak willed to act. Right. He's not able to take a true kind of revenge. So, I mean, look, am I really supposed to like figure out what this thing is? All right. So like use Digico. Like what am I supposed to do? One. All right. Enter. remember like playing this game a while ago where I don't know if I said this in the last stream where uh, I had to like like I was bad at math but I still like figured out like like ha like what is the probability of like guessing something because I didn't know how to like figure out like whatever the you know whatever the um game was that you like you had to do to like figure out what the code was so I was like all right if I just sit down and I try to figure out like all the possibilities here, um, and I, and I would have to do like, you know, a math in two ways, either you're allowed to reuse the numbers or you can't. Right. And I remember like the reusing of the numbers turned out to be something like, uh, like millions upon millions of possibilities. So I was like, all right, I, I can't do this. And I stopped playing it. Um, so let's see, is it, is there, is there something here that would tell me, um, All right, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. F zero C. All right, well that doesn't help. All right, I already started kind of like very 
you know, very deep with you guys. So maybe maybe uh, you're already a little bit kind of scared that this is going to be too much for you to handle, all right? If you're already uh, just still dealing with, oh, how about this? Maybe there's uh, something going on here, some kind of number. Let's see. What kind of number we got? Oh, here we got code 3748. All right, great. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll play this a little bit so that you guys are uh, not thinking that I'm being too too hard on you, right? All right? Too hard on you too quickly, right? But I mean, we're gonna get through this book, guys. Like, and I expect you to read it, right? If if you if if you're not gonna fucking like have this um, set of expectations for yourself, hold yourself to like a set of standards. Um, I will. I'll fucking tell you that you have to, right? Because that's what I that's what I did for myself. Or oh, nobody else would. Alright, so do I have to go all the way there? Seems nice and far. Um, one thing I, I, I do kind of regret about this game so far is, so like, it's been, well, like a couple hours altogether of playing it. There haven't been, even may, maybe this is still kind of like in the kind of like introductory mode, but there aren't like any sort of secrets, right? Like if I... You know, if I missed if I missed anything in in the back, like, it seems like I wouldn't have like gotten any like important items or like any sort of like interesting interactions. Like it, it does uh, uh, sort of put you in a kind of like totally linear spot. I love this fucking cat. Oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to curse on this one. Sorry, guys. So it goes back there, right? It's almost as if like they, like if you think about like world building or whatever, like, you know, what do they do here? They probably set this up in such a way where like all those messages like coming here for help, blah, blah. It seems as if there are at the very least cats, right? Or some other kind of beings that are routinely coming, you know, like into this like new, you know, cybernetic kind of world, right? This like cyberpunk world. And here, you know, the reason why the bucket comes back is, and that's the thing, if it's a bucket, I mean, these creatures have to be kind of small, right? It doesn't seem like there's any water here being transported. Maybe there is water being transported back and forth, right? Maybe this is the only way. And then down here, like, what is that, right? There is like some kind of flesh, right? Some kind of growth, right? Then you have these uh, either, I don't know, like mushrooms or like some sugar. Oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to say that. All right. <laughs> I don't mean to be condescending to you guys, but uh, I also don't want YouTube to flag this video as like kids can't watch it when I'm trying to get when I'm trying to get the kids. Postcard. All right. What does that give me? We've got a kind of like memento kind of thing going on. If you want another, you know, bit of art to really sink your teeth into, right? If you have no purpose, check out the film Memento. Great movie. All right. We have a little bit of a memento. New memory recovered. See? We've got that going on. Um, first let me see if there's anything else here first that I might have missed. I really do hope there are, like, secrets, right? Anyway, so, here we have, um, like, chapter three, right? We're part one, uh, this, like, vengeance, right? And, and this, like, concept of revenge. Uh, and, and he wonders, how is it possible that some people, they can stand up for themselves, right, and take revenge if they need to, right? And this is uh, one of the excerpts from the text. With people who know how to revenge themselves and to stand up for themselves in general, how is it done? Why, when they are possessed, let us suppose, by the feeling of revenge, 
and for the time there is nothing else but that feeling left in their whole being. Such a gentleman simply dashes straight for his object like an infuriated bull with its horns down, and nothing but a wall will stop him. By the way, facing the wall, such gentlemen, that is, the direct persons of men of action, are generally nonplussed. For them a wall is not an evasion, as for us people who think and consequently do nothing. It is not an excuse for turning aside, an excuse for which we are always very glad, though we scarcely believe in it ourselves as a rule. No, they are nonplussed in all sincerity. The wall has for them something tranquilizing, morally soothing, final, maybe even something mysterious, but of the wall later, right? And I would even like add to this a little bit, right? Um, the wall uh, is not even a wall, right, for some people, right? Um, I mean, there's like s tons of stuff that people uh, uh, go through, right, that seem like walls, that seem like obstacles, and, you know... Uh, obstacles very often are just in your head right especially for this narrator like so many of these obstacles are essentially very much almost purely in his head right and that that's important to remember right and, and one thing that's interesting at this point is like in terms of like separating Dostoevsky from the narrator himself right what is this he is creating he is creating this like anti-hero right he's somebody that you are supposed to empathize with and you know like feel a certain way for and, and understand in some way but he's also an anti-hero right and he's not um uh, he's not someone that is like traditionally good in any regard right and what the narrator does is he attacks what he calls the stupid man right the stupid man of action who's able to act thus right and, and keep in mind what he said earlier right that he hates the fact that he thinks of himself as so much more clever than everyone around him. And let's say he truly believes that, that he's more clever than everybody around him. If that's in fact the case, you must A, be looking down on you know so many others that are around you. And B, when you do see the so-called man of action that is able to act regardless of the fact that he's less intelligent than you, that does kind of like you know, uh, 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 rub you the wrong way. At least it does the narrator, right? And Dostoevsky is very conscious of this, right? I'm sure he's aware of this when he's writing it. And um, so in this attack on the stupid man, right, um, uh, he, it's, 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 it, it's interesting because like when he talks about like, the exaggerated consciousness, this thing that is supposed to be like a be-all, end-all, right? He thinks of it as a good in and of itself, right? The, the, able, the ability to think good in and of itself. But he never does, with the exception of writing this book, which we'll get to later, he never does seem to be do anything worthwhile, right? It's as if like he, he feels like his intelligence, which is at least partly, you know, kind of like a genetic inheritance, right? It's a gift, right? It's not something that... Um, uh, grant, like, of course, you could always increase intelligence, you could progressively, like, when I started reading, right, and one of the things that really kept me reading is, like, I felt literally like my brain growing, right, I felt like I was able to understand so much more, I was forging connections that I thought, you know, I could never see before, that I never saw before, right, but generally speaking, like, I needed some sort of, like, internal, like, physical blueprint for that to occur, I couldn't, you know, just, just read, right uh just become like i needed some kind of blueprint of intelligence to already be there right uh, uh for that to occur but and most people they do have some baseline of intelligence where they could do like everybody can do much much more than they're doing now right? especially if you're doing nothing you know you could do much more than you're doing now um but he he seems to view this intelligence as a good in and of itself despite the fact that he lives life very very selfishly right he he gives back very little with the exception, again, of, of uh, possibly writing this book, right? Um, so, like, I, I'm calling this, like, a kind of like Nietzsche's, like, slave morality where he sees a man of action, which is also, I mean, why can't that be a good in and of itself, right? If intelligence is uh, the ability to act, right? A, a kind of a good, right? And Nietzsche would say, like, this is a good, right? And anybody that says otherwise... Right, they're simply trying to turn their weaknesses, uh, not not actually turning them into strengths in terms of like working in their weaknesses, but turning their weaknesses into strengths by forcing others to, you know, to to like regard them as strengths, even if they do nothing to to earn that right, right. And, and one thing that uh, to get back to this idea of uh, Podpolya, right? Again, Russian title, Zapiski's Podpolya. Uh, he comp compares himself to a mouse, like living under these floorboards, right? 
uh, a mouse that is uh, too cowardly to act, but a mouse that nonetheless, even if it can't take revenge, it could fantasize about revenge, right? It turns over all the slights uh, uh, again and again. It adds to them, right? Makes them even larger and larger, polishes them, right? It makes them realer than they are, right? Later on, when he becomes obsessed with this like cop, right, that uh, he tries to uh, bump, right? The cop doesn't even remember him, right? Th these, are, these are fantasies in his head, Right, and even if they have a kernel of reality, the way that he treats them is it's not it's not you know reality in the traditional sense of reality. Um, so, um, uh, and later on, like this idea of the wall, like it does take on a slightly different meaning. But the the way that I would sort of uh, think about this idea of a wall is just just view it as something that um, you know it's an obstacle that is. An excuse, right? It may be real. It might have some level of like baseline reality, but it's still nonetheless a kind of excuse, right? And it's an excuse because you don't want to deal with, I mean, w what exactly are these entailments, right? Uh, if you are, uh, uh, if you do have to finally, you know, live your life uh, uh, post obstacles, like what does that mean to you? Right? What does that mean for you? Um, so, wait, okay. Oh, I guess I could down here, yeah. Um, and and uh, another thing that he says, right? Uh, he 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 starts this. Uh, he starts up on this formula, right, early on, like two times two equals four, and he's like, I don't want two times two to have to be four. I want to rebel against this. All right. The question that I would ask is, especially like if um, you know Dostoevsky. Uh, uh, believes uh, that there is a sort of like uh, internal kind of a consistency here. What exactly, you know, is the replacement for two times two equals four, right? Not that it, it necessarily, I mean, you could have a sort of open mind about this and say, you know, maybe uh, 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 th there is uh, something here that could be used uh, that is like more useful in some situations than this formula. But what exactly is going to be the replacement? And what is exactly is the motivation for trying to attempt to uh, gain this, this uh, uh, replacement as an advantage, right? And so he says, merciful heavens, but what I, but what do I care for the laws of nature and arithmetic when for some reason, I, oh shit, I dislike those laws and the fact that twice two equals four. Of course, I cannot break through the wall. I'm going to try to like, oh man. No, they can't jump up. All right. All right. I dislike those laws and the fact that twice two makes four. Of course, I cannot break through the wall by battering my head against it if I really have not the strength to knock it down. Uh, but that's like another bit of imagination, right? Or do you not have the strength? Or are you imagining you don't have the strength? I see a figure down there. But I am not going to be reconciled to it simply because it is a stone wall and I have not the strength, right? So... Again, this kind of like almost uh, a waste, right? And what I would ask is like, so why this wall, not another, right? Why the conflation of the first wall of dignity with this one, right? Um, in terms of like, like forget about it, like even getting revenge, but to stand up for yourself in a kind of like basic way, right? What, is it, what does it mean to not have the strength to stand up for yourself? That literally is just like an invention in your own head, right? Isn't it? And there's nothing preventing you. In fact, like the, the funny thing is like when people start to stand up for themselves, like in terms of like bullies or whatever, uh, they kind of like quickly realize like, wow, like bullies kind of like they, they kind of like go away when you stand up for yourself. Because I mean, they're just feeding like like the odd thing is like the, these people that the narrator sort of like in this kind of a begrudging way almost look, looks up to even if he criticizes them. These bullies are are people that are, uh, um, you know, they're people that are kind of like in some senses as weak as he himself feels himself to be, right? Maybe not in every sense, but definitely in some senses, right? So this kind of conflation that he makes uh, and all this like logic, that's the thing, he's, he keeps like trying to establish like a, a system, even if he's trying to push against the system, right? Um, he, 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 this like anti-system that he's trying to establish, Right, even according to its own kind of internal logic, right? There's there's a uh, wiggle room for him that that he would rather not see, right? So let's just go down here a little bit. 
a toothache chapter. I'm not even going to talk about too much about it. It's like a kind of an extended chapter where he says, uh, you know, watch carefully to the man that is uh, having a toothache. He begins with a toothache and then eventually he's in the situation where he's moaning for the hell of it, right? He's moaning just to annoy others. And I, I didn't find it like too compelling or too interesting, right? The, the writing isn't that uh, great to begin with um, uh, in, in in the chapter and the connections are kind of like, you know, it's, it's a little bit weak, right? I, I, I haven't, uh, I haven't much come across this uh, uh, kind of person, right, with a toothache. And granted, I mean, you could maybe talk about other kinds of complaints, but specifically the toothache is... Uh, it, it it didn't it didn't seem like it cohered that much, right? And I mean, later on he does mention the two. So there's like a kind of cross connection going on, like better than nothing. But um, it it wasn't uh, uh, it it didn't strike me as uh, as as good as some of the sort of other rhetorical flourishes in the first part of the book. Chapter five, he talks about his ennui, right? His boredom, uh, his total inaction. Right. And, and it a ends in this way. Right. Which I thought was a uh, very nice. Right. And you might again, some of you guys might see yourself here. Right. Uh, I definitely have like some of these uh, tendencies within myself to the extent that I even get on the stream and just literally talk for like hours. Right. Just to like just to talk. Right. So the way that the chapter ends is granted, I am a babbler, a harmless, vexatious babbler like all of us. But what is it to be done? If the direct and sole vocation of every intelligent man is babble, that is, the intentional pouring of water through a sieve, right? And I mean, some of the personalities like that I talk about on this channel, whether it's like Christopher Langan, I'm going to talk about in a couple of days. This other guy, Matthew Iglesias, right? He's one of these like policy wonks on Twitter, one of these like totally like uh, self-obsessed, totally narcissistic people who tweets literally like every five minutes, right? It's just... Just thinking about it is giving me a headache, right? It's just like babble, right? It's just babble, babble, babble. You want to hear yourself speak. And it's not about anything worthwhile. I mean, like um, a lot of these people are just dead wrong about so many things in life. And yet they keep kind of failing upwards, right? And uh, like the, the narrator, right? I mean, I could talk about Matthew Iglesias, but um, there's, you know, there's always been people like this, right? The, the, uh, the narrator may not be a great guy, but the people that he encounters are not great people either, right? His former friends and colleagues or whatever, they don't strike me as very good people either, right? Um, and it's the same kind of situation, right? It's, it's this kind of like, uh, 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 you know, this like incessant need to have a noise in your ear and to just like babble, 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 right? To just chirp, chirp, chirp. Right. And later on in chapter six, he talks about laziness uh, as being insufficient of an explanation for his ennui. He says, in fact, that if if I was truly, truly um, lazy, at least I could res respect myself more because I would have a reason to be this way. Right. That's like another odd thing. Right. He is uh, on the one hand trying to like obviate reasons by creating kind of like anti system. And yet he, he knows that he needs reasons. He needs like something to grab onto, something objective for him to have any level of respect for himself. All right, so let's see what these guys are doing. Like who? Like what? Like I'm trying to figure out who are these like little flesh mice? All right, it's kind of like in some senses like a uh, a cat's worst nightmare. Right, uh, a cat might have this uh, instinct to chase a mouse or like any other like critters that might be small, smaller than it. But what if you have something like this with like tentacles that could touch you, that could hunt you down, right? But is but is also significantly smaller than you are, and just like squeaky, 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 right? So I mean, it's a ni it's a nice little touch, right? This game does definitely have nice little choices like that. The slums. All right, so let's see. Is this figure gonna be scared? Oh man. Am I gonna be chased now? Shit. so scared of it's a goddamn cat
It's all these like aesthetics like in one, right? This is like a, almost like an Asiatic kind of thing going on here. From the, uh... Why does he even need a sun hat, though? Alright, so is... Am I supposed to get a weapon of some sort? So they really, like, funnel you... They really... They really funnel you through, like, um... <clears throat> Like doing the things they want to do, which kind of like, I mean, for to the extent that video games will eventually become, you know, more and more kind of like art like, there's going to be a lot of funneling going on, right? Uh, there's there's a limit to what uh, an open world experience can do with, uh, you know, less limited choices. Because again, with art, like you need an artist, right? You need someone taking you down a tunnel, even if, even if it branches out, you need a goddamn tunnel. Again, so far uh, with the dialogue, maybe this is going to change, but I do appreciate how matter of fact and prosaic it is, right? Because the attempts at like being poetic and dramatic or melodramatic is just, you know, it's one of the worst things about games, right? Uh, I, I like just come me the come me the, the, the melodrama. So before I go further, let's just go back to uh, some of the text a little bit. All right, uh, we're, we're getting closer and closer to kind of like the more kind of like philosophical heft, right? This idea of enlightened self-interest, right? Um, and uh, back to like uh, the, the book, What is to be Done, um, the, the idea behind it was sort of like... Uh, uh, enlightened self-interest, right? The idea that you could have an egoism that is for the greater good, right? You could have this in a, you know, socialistic kind of sense in the way that the book was arguing, or you could have this in a libertarian, abject libertarian sense of uh, what people like, you know, uh, Ayn Rand or whatever would argue that, oh, look, you know, if I simply go out and I start a corporation and make billions and billions of dollars, that in and of itself is uh, innately good right right it's like uh you know like all these like justifications for just doing exactly what you would have done anyway right to get all these other perks all these benefits that uh, you pretend are, are sort of like not not part of the equation here um or rather like not not being like the ultimate uh, uh thing that makes any of it uh worthwhile right for you right and not just for you but like also the fact that whatever your self-interest is uh, you're the one that's extracting the majority of the value, right? It's not merely that what you're doing also happens to be good for others. You are extracting the primary value, right? And oftentimes those externalities are not even, you know, part of the discussion, right? O others have to bear the costs, right? Even as you claim that they're not costs, right? There's a kind of like whitewashing of costs. Um, uh, uh, and so, so anyway, uh, th this idea of online self-interest, right? So Dostoevsky is mocking this and also the narrator is mocking it. Right? He mocks the idea that, quote, the man who recognizes self-interest, he'll be able to act correctly, be good, right? Um, and I mean, to me, like, this is a, a, a correct critique, right? But also strikes me as kind of trivial. And I mean, part of this is simply because, like, philosophically, it, it wasn't uh, truly developed just yet. But, uh, you know, I always go back to this idea of the social contract, right? Um it is immaterial whether or not, say, a Nazi uh, accepts the social contract, right, or acts against it, or it's also relevant if you do accept the social contract, right? That might say something about how you're forced to live in the world, interact with the world, but it changes nothing about, you know, the, the kind of oughts, right? Uh, let's call them oughts, uh, you know, within a social contract, right, that, that rationalism would imply, 
right? And this idea that this becomes like this new stone wall that you bash your head against because you don't want to deal with it, um, it strikes me as a little bit trivial, at least how it uh, plays out, and uh, maybe not in the entire book, but in parts of the book, right? Uh, uh, he uh, he posits uh, th- this idea, right, um, uh, of... Uh, uh, like advantage taking, right? Everything in society and everything in civilization is advantage taking, right? And, and 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 anybody that claims otherwise, right? They're just engaging in a logical exercise to sort of hit upon their own motivated reasoning. Implicit in this, of course, is that he's also doing the same thing, right? There's also a ton of motivated reasoning within his own self, right? And and what he hates specifically is this deterministic crystal palace, right? If you could get enough logic in the world, you might be forced. Uh, through the social contract or some some other means, to uh, 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 you know to to sort of deal with this unbreakable crystal palace, right? That is the determinism. You cannot uh, escape it in some senses, right? And to him, civilization is an ever greater variety of experiences and sensations, right? Um, this is kind of like what what moves human beings, and I think especially like now, right? That's an interesting concept to think about. Right when you look at the ways that people, like even if they have like poor conditions or whatever, a lot of them have been sort of, um, you know, they, they've had the fight taken out of them just by, just by, like I said earlier, like the cratering of the attention span that takes a fight out of you, right? If you have a crater attention span, and there's no purpose in life that is able to bring some of that back, right? To get you back to this idea of. I actually do have something to look forward to, to deal with, to know, to have, to jut against, right? There's nothing wrong with having, you know, a, a stone wall. That stone wall creates life in many important respects, right? It's not just there to taunt you. And to the extent that it does taunt you, it's totally up to you, right? Uh, whether the taunt kills you or whether it leads to some sort of action, right? But but uh, I do uh, uh, think there's something of value in this idea of, uh, of civilization being an, uh, an ever greater threshold of activity and experience. And I mean, the arts are like this, right? If you think about like what the earliest, most primitive art forms were like, the earliest, most primitive music, right? Maybe s- some uh, uh, apes are sitting around and they start slapping their thighs and someone starts to, you know, do the kind of reverb, right? Beck and call someone else starts slapping their thighs and little by little like you have like the formation of music it's very very different than the kinds of things that would happen with the music today right simply by being less primitive by being more complex uh, it, its own kind of its very nature in many important respects starts starts to change right but uh if you start applying this idea of a variety of experiences to like political questions to interpersonal relations right th- th- I, I think it's very fruitful Right, it makes you sort of see things in a new way, right? He he posits that of all the possible uh, 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 advantages, right, uh, in the world, um, there is one personal advantage that will upend all systems, right? An advantage that will go beyond logic, right? Beyond good and evil, beyond right and wrong. Right, and it, it's simply this idea of personal preference, right, and the ability to have preferences. He believes that this upends all systems. Now, I don't know if Dostoevsky himself thought that this was a kind of like a, you know, a foolproof argument, but to me, you know, like I, I don't, I don't see, you know, I don't see a reason why a, a personal advantage, right, or a personal choice, independent choice, should append the system any more than any other system might, or any more than any other objection might. I'm going to get to some of these specifics later, right? And I'm also not even so sure that, you know, human beings as a rule necessarily want independent choice. I mean, to some degree, I mean, like, I remember, like, when I was teaching, right, like, one one big thing that I would do is, like, I would pretend that the kids had a choice, right? Um, I would want them to do, like, something, right, a task, and I would say, okay, You have two choices. You could do this or you could do that. And then suddenly, you know, they feel in control. So there's probably something like there's like a biological response to this feeling of like freedom. But, you know, as I get older and I see what people are like, uh, uh, people do to some degree like, you know, like sort of like bristle this idea of not having choice. But more than anything, like people, you know, people want to be spoon fed. People want to be told where to go, what to do, what to think. 
They don't even want to be told why, right? They want the what, right? They want to just deal with the what. Um, and uh, in, in terms of like a, the, the quality of the writing, I, I think a good artistic choice is, you know, Dostoevsky, he's critical of the Crystal Palace, but still like even to this, to this point, right, where this kind of cowardice of the narrator is being admitted by the narrator and you start to kind of like lose respect in, in, in some ways for this guy. You know, he turns him into an anti-hero, right? He, he, he makes you want to empathize with someone who is like not good. Right in the same way that if you read Shakespeare's uh, *Merchant of Venice*, um, uh, the Jew of Venice, he's not a good guy, and yet clearly there's a ton of discrimination in that era, and he talks about the bigotry that he faces as a Jew. Um, and despite facing bigotry as a Jew, like he he doesn't become good because of it. He's you know he's still like evil, but. Uh, Th that is a good choice. And another example in, in The Tempest, right? Shakespeare turns, turns Caliban into a rapist, turns Caliban into like a bad guy. And yet, just like with the, 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 just like with the Jew in Venice, he gives into his mouth a number of very eloquent speeches that criticizes the context surrounding them, criticizes the people around these people, right? And that, that, that is a, like, when, when you think about the layers in art, that's a very good artistic choice to make, right? You don't want villains to be purely cartoons. And um, you have to remember that uh, to the extent that villains become totally, you know, like dysmorphic, right, in a sense, that they, they, they become beings who maybe begin with a grievance that makes sense, or perhaps they, they pick up grievances along the way that make sense. You know, they, 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 they distort these grievances to something else entirely, but you want to sort of at least uh, flesh out some of the grievances, right? So let's just play a little bit before uh, going further into these, like, uh, more complex. Let's see, show item. Let's see what they got for me. Postcard. So that's ultimately where I'm going, I guess. Momo. Are there any of the cats here? I want to get like... What's... Alright. Hopefully I'm not forced to go there. I want to check out what's going on here. Anytime I see a rug, I'm going to do this. Seventy-four years, so this must be taking place far in the future. You know, this reminds me of this. This has the same kind of like in Chrono Trigger. It has the um, when you get to the uh, what's it called to the uh, like the future place. Yes, I did. Alright. I guess this is where we're at. Let's see if there's any, like, items. Let me translate and see what this is. Right, I mean, even something like this, right? You're looking at a piece of uh, text, right, that they can't read. Uh, only our ancestors can distinguish these colors, right? To make that as a kind of like, you know, stand-in for translation, right? It's, you know, it's a nice little touch. Um, better than 
most games would. But simply by like simply by not being like melodramatic and like needlessly poetic and shit, right? So are they gonna let me now go further? Oh, so I can talk to these now. Hmm. If only a cat could talk. Fake? What is that? F. Oh. I wonder if that changes the dialogue options. Since I... Since I uh, rubbed against his leg or whatever. No. It doesn't, it, do, it, it does not melt his heart. It does not melt his heart. Alright, so now we got like, we got like some, you know, seems like many more choices. One thing I do hope here is that I don't uh, get lost. Is there like a mini map or something? All right. Ooh. There's a staircase. There's a lot of stuff going on here. See what's going on. Second floor. One thing they're also doing is they're not giving you an incentive to show the picture to everybody. They keep trying to like get you to uh, see that guy, whoever he is in... Uh, you know, with that neon sign or whatever, but um, beyond just like some, you know, fairly basic dialogue. Hmm, music sheet. They're not giving you a reason to like ask everybody, right? It seems like they're not, like they're not gonna give you, um, you know, they're not gonna give you like special items or whatever. Some like chips in a, a water bowl. All right, I'm not drinking that. Is there something else to do to it though? I guess not. All right, so we're getting some more. We're getting some more, um, you know, kind of like a little bit of feedback for actually exploring. Right, it's not just uh so where I come from this was so is the whole village open to me now I 
like, is there a mini map? Like, what is the. What if I press M? putting you on your own. day and I got to write tonight and I hate having all these multiple sessions in front of a computer oh, but I gotta I gotta do a lot guys but I, I truly do just like loathe like sitting down right I can only do it in short spurts so it takes a lot for me to like get uh, get up to it Anyway, let's let's get back to uh, the text a little bit uh, here. So, uh, chapter eight. All right, we're getting uh, close to uh, the end uh, of the first part. Right, we're talking about free will. Right, um, and so when he's talking about this idea of like the kind of like supreme advantage, right? Uh, the um, you know the the kind of like a, a advantage that will you know. A, a, outdo you know any system you know the, the the most advantageous advantage i believe is what the phrasing was in in the garnet translation um in terms of like establishing a free will right they're saying a person can choose what is most injurious to him and must if he is to prove that he has the right to act contrary to reason right and, and this is what he gets after again and again right he wants to be able to prove to himself that he could act any way that he pleases and that if he so chooses, it could be self-destructive, it could be contrary to reason, it could be contrary to any kind of system, but just to do it, right, for the sake of, of doing it, right, to prove that a man is not a piano key, right? He's not just there to serve some kind of function, right? Even if it's like a, a highfalutin function, such as being an artist, for instance, right? He's not merely there to serve that function. Right. Um, and the way that uh, the narrator phrases this, and this is, I think, where you start seeing more and more fractures in this guy's mind and perhaps like maybe some fractures in, in some of the uh, uh, rhetorical flourishes of Dostoevsky himself. Right. Uh, uh, he says that this kind of like the ability to, to make a supreme choice. Right. Um, that is outside of this uh, concept of enlightened self-interest. That preserves the most impactful thing to the narrator, which is uh, the personality, a right? human personality, human differences, right? Uh, the fact that you are an individual individuated from everybody else. And um, it, like it, when I was reading that, it's like, you know, is, is that really the most impactful thing? Because when I think about it, a personality, again, in and of itself, or going back to this idea of like whether something is in and of itself uh, a, a good uh, or if it needs a certain context, or if it needs like some something else as an input, you know, a personality is just a personality, right? There's nothing s uh, special about it to the extent that, like, w when you think about, like, think about like all the people that you know in life, right? Um, everybody has like a different aura. Everybody has a different personality. Everybody has like a different set of ticks. Like anybody that I can think of, right? They're all, you know, they're all like even in the super, even if it's in a superficial sense, they're all pretty unique, right? Like of all the like hundreds or thousands of people that I met, like just like a, a, a mode of being a, a, a about them, right? It's, it's just different, right? From person to person. But that is, you know, he's calling it the most impactful thing, but in many respects, it's perhaps the most superficial thing. Because even if you could take a thousand people, right? Put them in a room and they're all different, right? When you interact with them. Are they going to be different in terms of like their perspectives on, I don't know, like a work of art or like art in general? 
Are they going to be that different uh, when it comes to, I don't know, like their political opinions? Are they going to be that different when it comes to just like just like how they view the world? And I think, you know, overwhelmingly, the answer is people are very much the same. Like if you look at my recent arguments under the Christopher Langan video, is Christopher Langan a fraud? Um, the kinds of responses that I'm getting, it's the same exact responses that I saw when it came to all these other Christopher Langan fans that you'd find on various like internet forums, right? Defending him, whether it's on his Facebook, whether it's like wherever, they all sound the same. They all say the same nonsense, right? They all seem to have the same like uh, mental instability, right? They, they, they all seem to have the same set of issues, right? And they all seem to have the same limitations and they all seem to have the same needs, Right. And to the extent that they're all, if you put them in a room, you know, if I interact with them, I'm sure they're all going to be different. Right. They're going to go about some of these things different. But that doesn't seem to be the most impactful thing. The most impactful thing right out of those people is how utterly the same they are. Right. It's not the fact that they're individuated. It's the fact that they're the same. But even like getting beyond like uh, uh, that. Right. In and of itself, like a personality is not truly impactful, is it? right? A personality of a certain kind is impactful. Certainly the fact that this unnamed narrator is a certain way and has a very, you know, specific kind of very unique personality that has driven him to uh, uh, live the life that he's living in this book, right? But in and of itself, like a personality is nothing, right? I mean, when you say personality, like what exactly do you mean? Do you mean, you know, a uh, 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 you know, like human curiosity, right? Because that's the odd thing. Like when uh, when he uh, talks ill of his colleagues and his former friends, right? It's because they're not as intelligent as he is. It's because they don't view the world appropriately, right? Um, but they all have personalities and they're all making their same choices, right? It seems oddly enough that the narrator is kind of making the argument whether or not he realizes, whether or not you know, Dostoevsky realizes again. Again, I want to make those distinctions. And also that it doesn't truly matter what Dostoevsky thinks here. I mean, we just have the book. We could just talk about the book, what's in the book. But the narrator seems to have this kind of like implicit belief that uh, uh, even if he could talk about the personality in this kind of like highfalutin way, uh, these other friends like that don't understand the world or whatever, uh, they all have personalities, but it doesn't matter, does it, right? Because their personalities don't amount to anything worthwhile. Their personalities don't get them to do things that they ought to be doing. Because, you know, he has in his own head uh, a very peculiar set of oughts, right? He might try to, like, escape ought, right, uh, as much as he tries, but he never is tr truly able to do that, right? He has his own set of oughts, right? Um so uh, uh, the final point I would make about this, this idea of personality, right, uh, specifically as it applies to the narrator is as he's like, you know, butting against this, this uh, crystal palace and he says this, this logic for the sake of logic, this internal consistency, this thing that is uh, meant to not ever be transcended, this thing that is both uh, safe but also just being so hard right? In the kind of like Nietzschean sense of hardness, right? The construction of hard men, right? They're able to look at reality as it is, right? And are able to act appropriately, right? It seems to me like with this kind of like fetish of personality, he is in his own way just establishing yet another crystal palace, right? He may not admit this, right? He may not see it, Right. He 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 thinks of himself as highly sort of refined, and intelligent, but he seems to not understand at least this part. Right. That he's constructing yet another crystal palace. Right. We've replaced logic with personality. Right. Logic is the greatest good. Well, no, personality is the greatest good. In both those cases, it's kind of meaningless. Right. Lo lo like lo even logic in and of itself. Right. You could construct a perfectly logical edifice, right, out of hot air. And it could be this beautiful, totally convoluted cathedral of thought. I mean, the law in some ways is like this, right? I mean, some some sort of like baseline things, like where the law comes from. Like it is in many ways a kind of a cathedral. But I mean, that, that's just what we're doing, right, with logic, 
right? Again, in of itself, you know, like you always have to ask, well, logic to what end? Uh, what layering, right? Um, but but he is in some senses here just replacing a crystal palace uh, of logic with a crystal palace of personality, right? And he talks about the, these uh, uh, tangents, right? Uh, human beings want tangents because they're afraid of attaining their object, right? But what I would say is it's also because they're, they're afraid of attaining what is hard, right? It is hard to do that, right? For you to attain your object, for the narrator to attain some of the objects, and he could deny that he has this this or that object, but later on, like, I, I'll get into some of the pieces in the text that it reveals that he has, like, any number of objects, right, that he tries to constantly sort of, like, you know, bury in this... Uh, uh, um, portfolio, right, right. He's he's trying to like get get under these uh, uh, floorboards and and sort of like hope that nothing else comes out, right. Other than the sort of like you know chirpings of a mouse, um. But but yeah, you, you know he, he has this like wall, right. That he says that he's too cowardly to sort of uh, hit his head against, right. That that is also you know that is also a, a reason why uh, people are afraid to attain object. I mean, like even like even like this channel, right? I mean, uh, like a few years ago, I set up for a short time a Patreon, and then I turned it off and I stopped uploading stuff because I mean, I just got busy, right? I, I was doing other things in my life. Uh, I was uh, you know I was working, right? I was trying to like to get to a place where I could like actually dedicate myself to what I'm doing now, like to like more seriously. Do this Patreon more seriously. Tackle YouTube more seriously. Um, uh, uh, sort of a uh, get people to you know maybe uh, view the world in a new way, and that's also kind of scary because like once you do that, you are burning these bridges, right? You are sort of saying this past life that I had, I can't live that life anymore, right? I have to now do something new, and it has to be successful, right? Because if it's not, I mean, I have to go back to doing the old thing, and then it feels like I wasted time, right? That's another thing that's difficult, right? It's not merely that the attainment of the object is difficult, right? It's not, it's, it's not merely that you attain the object and then suddenly there's boredom, right? Uh, it's, it's, it, it's also the fact that any time that you attain, like, and like, like speaking of like back to like motivated reasoning and like what is truly going on through the narrator's head, I mean, it is kind of interesting, isn't it? That here he is, he's talking about, um, you know, really, like, people attain their objects and suddenly they grow bored, right? So what's the point of attainment? But really, attainment has entailments, right? If you attain something, especially if it's something of value, that, you know, that forces any number of responsibilities upon you. Like, you have to now protect this object. You have to cultivate it. You have to cherish it. You have to watch it grow, right? If I'm going to be out here putting up videos of me writing, guess what that means? It means I have to make sure that I do a good job on the writing. I have to make sure that I'm not scared, right, to release this, like, in the public before it's actually done, these dra drafts or whatever. I have to keep watering this thing, right? So it's not merely that I've attained, I've, I have attained it and it's not what I thought it would be, you know, uh, uh, the process was really all that it was. No, you know, the, a process begets yet more process. And this is really, this is what the scary thing is, right? The scary part of all this here is process begets yet more process, okay? Right? Um, so as you're reading this text, right, just keep in mind some of the motivations of the narrator and keep in mind the fact that Many of the things that he says, even if they do kind of sound reasonable a little bit in some in some respects, right? There's always a, a an underlying reason that he is not willing to tell you, and that maybe he himself is not even fully aware of. So, be, uh, before I, I finish the first part, let's just play a little more. Let's see what's going on. Anything? So am I gonna get something? I want some of that. What is it? What is that liquid? Take energy drink. Okay. Is that um? 
It's like, is that an object that I have now? Yeah. So I'm guessing I'm probably going to have to uh, do that. Like, maybe I'm going to be getting chased by some kind of like... Yeah. Yeah, you know what cats do, right? Cats can really trip you. I almost fall down the stairs multiple times because of my cats. Right? You try to feed them and they get excited. So they try to get ahead of you. Boom. So I'm probably going to get chased at some point, right, by those like little critters or maybe something else. And I'm, I might need an, uh, like an extra like boost of uh, energy to, to do that. Ooh, and I got she music, right? So maybe I'm going to get a little reward. Yeah, so there are like little, it seems like some of these things might be optional. I hope not everything here would be required, right? But it seems like. Uh, there's a, a number of options and maybe like the beginning pro is just a kind of like de facto, you know, tutorial, right? It's a strong ass cat. Reminds me of, uh, one of my cats. She was a, uh, when she was living in the street, she was like a major... Uh, tree climber, right? She'd always be up in the trees, right? So she's very athletic even now, right? Even like living indoors now for almost two years. Very, very athletic. And constantly trying to get on top of things and just like, you know, just like really kind of like powerful. But right? you could see the, the sort of like musculature in her back. See happens if I show like an energy drink. What was that? I missed that. Hmm. So he believes that there is a real sky. Does that mean that... Wait, is this the guy? Is this the guy that I'm supposed to show this? think so oh no it's not yeah momo is the guy but i mean if he's if he's talking about there being um you know actual light somewhere a real sky somewhere what are they drinking oh i said i was gonna do this every time oh am i just resting let's take a good look at this cat then Home stove. All right, so this world does feel fairly large. I, I mean, I have no idea how long the game is, though. I mean, I heard some people just, like, beat it just a few hours. It never takes me a few hours to do anything. to shine a light into them. Maybe that way. Maybe I could scratch now again. No? Take she music. Alright, so there's more. Who's that at the door? That's a very cheap way of like keeping me from going further. I could scratch again. I scratched once, so I can't scratch again. If I want to meet some nervous N Nelly there.
All right, let's just check around some of these uh, other spots. Oh. I want to I wanna get down. How do I get down? Let me get down. All right. Oh, so this is back to where I was. So wait, did I go down here yet? Yeah, he wants to talk. All right, so before we do that, Let's get back to this. So, uh, chapter 10, right, the penultimate chapter in the first part, right? Uh, so, the narrator, he fears the Crystal Palace, uh, and the quote is because it is made out of crystal, right? He doesn't want to have to submit to anything, right? Which, again, like it's kind of relevant if, uh, you know, again, it's immaterial whether or not someone wants to submit to the social contract. That's just like not. Um, it's just not, not a relevant lens to view anything, right? You're going to go crazy, uh, you know, th thinking in those terms, right? But in that regard, right, he continues to be uh, somewhat dishonest with himself, right? And, and this, is the, this is the quote. Um, but while I am alive and have desires, I would rather my hand were withered off than bring one brick to such a building. Don't remind me that I have just rejected the Palace of Crystal for the sole reason that one cannot put one put out one's tongue at it. I did not say because I'm so fond of putting my tongue out, right? So he's saying that, you know, it's it's not because I want to just kind of like uh, stick my tongue out at the, at, the pal uh, at the Crystal Palace. It's more so that I want to have the option to do so. Now, if you phrase it in those terms, it suddenly sounds, you know, very highfalutin, right? It sounds uh, a very noble in some respects. But, I mean, that's also a lie, right? Because later on, when you see him interacting with other people, you could tell that he very much does crave sticking his tongue out at it, right? It's not merely that he wants to have the option. He wants to consistently exercise this option again and again, right? Perhaps the thing I resented was the, that of all your edifices, there has not been one at which one could not put out one's tongue. On the contrary, I would let my tongue be cut off out of gratitude if things could be so arranged that I should lose all desire to put it out. It is not my fault that things cannot be so arranged and that one must be satisfied with model flats. And why am I made with such desires? Can I have been constructed simply in order to come to the conclusion that all my construction is a cheat? Can this be my whole purpose? I do not believe it. But you, but do you know what? I am convinced that we underground folk ought to be kept on a curb. Though we may sit 40 years underground without speaking, when we do come out into the light of day and break out, we talk and talk and talk. Um, I thought this was a very nice way of ending the chapter. And leading to the next chapter, right, the, the actual last chapter in the first part, um, where he basically says, you know what, uh, I'm going to sit down and write. So now this is as a 40-plus-year-old. He's sitting down to write, and he doesn't know why he wants to write down his thoughts, right? He has some sus suspicions. Maybe it's going to psychologically make him feel better or whatever, right? Maybe something else is going to happen, right? So... By not having a reason, right? He just, he says that he decide he's deciding to write, apropos of the falling snow, right? Which is a nice poetic way, right? Uh, of dealing with this question of like, why am I doing what I'm doing, right? He wants to get his thoughts down, doesn't know why. Um, but to me, I mean, it does seem like he damages his own proposed system by saying, uh, uh, writing things down. Like, why why write, right? Why not just like talk? Well. Writing things down, he says, makes them more imposing. And the reason why writing is so imposing is, you know, it kind of like it tells no no lies in some regards, right? Like you, you could either sit down and have all the time in the world to construct that thing and say just that thing that you want to say in an almost like perfect fashion. Right? Not that, you know, perfection ought to be the goal of art or anything like that. But you could, to the extent that there is anything like perfection, you could say... This is not sufficient for me. That is not sufficient for me, right? Uh, but writing, I'm going to be able to organize myself exactly as I see fit. There doesn't have to be some spectator, spectator right now, maybe in the future, 
No one is uh, forcing a timeline upon me. I don't have to rehearse and I don't have to perform, at least not in the traditional sense. Right? I could simply do what I want to do in the most kind of like objective way possible. Right. So, um, but, but by saying that, you know, writing essentially has this uh, indubitable value, right, to him or to others, uh, right, like there, there, there's something constructive going on here, right? It's, it's anti-lazy, right? He, he's talking about like, I'm not even lazy. I, I just have this in we, I don't want to do this. I don't want to, but he's doing it, right? That's the odd, I think that's the oddest part uh, about this book, right? He's, you know, he's, uh, uh, he's, he's talking about in a kind of like almost nihilistic fashion, you know, about creating like a, a an anti-system, right? A non-system, something where the most advantageous advantage is merely doing what you want to do, right? And that, you know, it's kind of like a, a beyond argument at that point. And yet he's turning 40 and he's deciding that enough is enough, right? Like, I've, I've been underground for too long. This is too much. I've not done anything. I need to write. It doesn't matter whether he realizes why he's doing it or what he's even doing. But he's finally, after living in a kind of very selfish way, he's finally uh, ready to give something back to the world, right? He's ready to give something back. And this book, right? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a very good novel, right? So he, he does give something of value back to the world, despite going on and on about, um, you know, that, you know, th that being in some senses immaterial. Another funny part about all this is uh, here and later, he talks about this kind of like theoretical audience, right? That he doesn't want an audience, right? The audience is for himself, but it's not, right? He, he still in this kind of like odd way, like wedded to the world, right? He wants to be part of the world, right? That's kind of like one of his core problems, right? If not his, his actual core problem, he wants to be part of the world in a way that makes sense to him, in a way that's healthy, but also in a way that doesn't force him to, to make uh, uh, unnecessary compromises. And um, perhaps these are compromises uh, of the self in terms of how he manages his time or whatever it might be. But these could be, you know, actual, you know, like value compromises, right? Uh, maybe working for uh, the government or whatever. He saw that he wasn't helpful. I mean, we don't even know the specifics there. But whatever it might be, right, there is this kind of theoretical audience. And I, what I would say is even if he's saying that, you know, this audience is me or maybe like whatever, like I've said this before, like in the last uh, stream about this, um, I, I'm trying to live my life uh, as if my audience is yet to be born, right? Grant that I am, you know, putting this out. Like, I do want people to subscribe, right? I do want people to be part of the Patreon. Uh, but generally speaking, that the part that I'm not going to compromise is my core audience. I want them to be people who are yet to be born, right? I want the future to be the audience. And if I want the future to be the audience... That means there's certain things that I cannot do, right? I can't just put up videos just for the sake of like, you know, uh, simply because I think they're going to be popular. Like I want there to be an actual justifiable long-term reason, right? A lot of the stuff that I do, I want it to feel evergreen, right? I, I don't want people to come to one of my videos and be like, damn, like you put up, you know, this, um, like to the extent that like video games, for example, get dated very quickly, Right, and they do. I mean, there's plenty of video games back from like the '90s or whatever that literally you cannot play anymore, right? Without like a huge like UI uh, overhaul, right? Um, and and uh, uh, but you know, here, like, what am I doing here? Like, I'm talking about other things, right? I'm I'm discussing this book, right? It's going to be like whether or not uh, people even know what this game is, like uh, decades from now, like they're still going to have uh, what I think is a you know fairly novel discu discussion of a very good book, right? You could like, you know, tune all the, you know, video out, right? You could just have the audio and you could just listen to me talk about it, right? And he, and this narrator is kind of the same way, isn't he, right? To the extent that he feels disconnected from the world, he wants his audience to be those people that would understand. Perhaps it means it has to be those people that are yet to be born, right? That's a possibility as well. 
So there's this kind of like, you know, this like strain of hypocrisy throughout the book that is an integral part of uh, 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 this uh, narrator's uh, personality, right? Right, and, and um, so like go, going to apropos of the falling snow, right? Um, the first chapter is, uh, is fairly long and, and it talks about how, you know, he's at the height of his depression, right? He is... You know, the back, so now we're back to his 20s, right? He feels totally disconnected. He's, he's part of this kind of like a, a civil service uh, job. And to like feel something, he wants to like either get in a fight or like do something to get like thrown out of a tavern or something. But he, he does, he's not able to do that. He gets kind of like uh, mostly ignored by this cop. And he feels dis disrespected by this cop. So he goes into this like very kind of long mouse-like revenge plot, right? Where he thinks like, maybe I'm going to challenge him to a duel. Maybe I'm going to do something else. I'm going to write a letter to him and, and say like, uh, you know, like I, I, I you know, I'm going to come out and kill you. Um, but ultimately what he decides on is, is the total sort of mouse thing of he spends his money needlessly on this like uh, coat, right? Some kind of like uh, rac raccoon or something, some sort of like raccoon coat, German raccoon, he calls it, which, uh, you know, it could be worn a few times, but later on, uh, uh, it, it starts to look bad. So anyway, he, he gets us the raccoon coat or whatever it is. And his whole plan is, I'm going to see this cop at some point. I'm going to check his schedule. I'm going to see where he walks. And we're going to sit down, or rather, I, I'm going to find him. And I'm going to, with my dignity intact, bump him, walk past him, not stop for him, and show him that I am his equal. And this is an entire chapter. This is a long chapter, one of the longer chapters in the book, actually. And he's like creating this plan, right? So clearly it's not like laziness that's getting him, right? It's not these other, like he, he finds a purpose, right? It's kind of odd, right? When he talks about, you know, the, the, the uselessness of a purpose, purpose. And yet here he is like very much, you know, fired up by this resolve, Right. And the irony, of course, is that ultimately when he does bump, in, bump into this cop, the cop doesn't even notice him. He just keeps on walking. And then he says something like, you know, it's been like 14 years since I've uh, seen this cop. And I, you know, I wonder where he's up to now. Like he was like relocated to like some new assignment or whatever. Um, so it's, it's not that the narrator can't find a purpose. It's not that there aren't things that are uh, uh, that, that could goad him to action. It's simply that the actions that he ultimately does take, they're, they are just kind of like pure self-indulgence, right? With, again, with the exception of writing this book. And it, it is kind of odd, again, that uh, uh, he does write the book and he almost tries to make excuses for it, right? As a kind of self-indulgence that, oh, I don't know why I'm doing it. It's going to make me sleep better. It's going to make me stop maybe fixating on this or that thing. Uh, which again, like he, he shows these are not value neutrals, right? These are values. They're not value neutrals. And yet, um, I mean, here we are, right? He's, uh, uh, he's, he's you know, creating the, 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 this purpose, right? Out of self-indulgence. Whereas like the book itself, right? That's not purely self-indulgent. The self-indulgence is what he says to almost like trick himself into writing it. He has to trick himself at that point in his life maybe not in his 20s or whatever but at that point in his life he has to trick himself to thinking that this is a purely a self-indulgence and the only reason why we're going to be even talking about this doing this whatever is because i can sort of like you know tickle my fancy right he he does not want to be seen at least by himself consciously while he's awake right which is another funny part i'll get to later he does not want to while awake uh, see himself as uh, being useful to society in some regard, right? And chapter two, right? There's this interesting part that kind of shows some of this where it starts with this, like, in this odd way. And I think it was a very good choice by, Dostoye by Dostoevsky where he basically has the narrator walking around talking about, like, uh, like debauchery, right? And, 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 like, his own dissipation. And you wonder, like, what, what exactly has he done? done right like what is he doing that is like causing this dissipation did he like go in like a drinking binge for a few days right um and then like go you know to a brothel or something like so he's walking around like feeling guilty right um uh but there's this like dissipation right 
Uh, and yet, like in between this dissipation, right, the reason why it seems important to him is that is set in contrast to what he feels to be his own blissful dreams, right? He has a bunch of like blissful dreams and the content of these dreams and the reason why they're blissful to him, they're also very interesting, right? Uh, he has dreams where he is useful to society, right? He has dreams where he is, by any kind of objective metric, good, right? Uh, 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 he has dreams where he's in society. He has dreams where he's essentially just like, you know, sitting around and uh, he's a great poet, for instance, right? Or he's a great intellectual. He's providing a service. And granted, like, yes, he is being worshipped in these dreams and he likes that. So it's, again, there is this kind of huge, like, narcissistic, self-indulgent quality. And yet the specific things that he's latching onto are things that are meritorious, right? There are things that merit being worshipped in a sense. The, the, these are things that uh, uh, are, are helping him in, in, some, in some respects, right? And helping the world, right? In a deeper respect, right? Um, and, and again, like this does contradict this idea of like uh, creating this anti-system, right? He, 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 he says that this is what he wants. Like his deepest dream is this, right? And the reason why he's acting contrary to this is simply to prove that he has a personality. And yet again, so far, right? Nothing truly worthwhile in this personality. So let's play a little more, see what happens, and then we'll we'll finish this up. I'm getting really hungry. I'm gonna be making one of my favorite dinners. It's gonna be um, uh, it's gonna be this like a Chinese uh, cilantro may fun dish, sesame oil, Anaheim peppers. Hmm. Interesting. What is that? What is a super spur detergent? Nah, I'm gonna fight. Maybe I'll need this for something. Well, obviously, I would. Hmm. Nah, I'm gonna do these exchanges when I need them. So I'm going to like, try to figure out what all these like little items would be for right before I make any kind of determinations as to what I'm going to trade. Eventually I'm going to need to trade something, right? I mean... Five eight two eight. What does that mean? Maybe, uh, maybe they're they're uh, yeah. Maybe they're all individual compositions. All right. Again, like they they really uh, should have had like a more kind of a especially if it's a kind of like a short game. We should have a, a reason to interact with these people a bit more. Wait, is there anything back there? No, that's it. Or are we back to the same? Is that what happened? Oh, yeah. Okay. So some of the stuff that seems like a little convoluted, there's uh, ways to move one way or the other. All right, try to figure that out. All right, yeah, so that's the market. That's the way to that area. Okay. Seems a little different than... See what happens here. And the scratches here indicate there's probably many uh, many cats coming in. 
Super spirit laundry, grandma. Like, what would I use the laundry detergent for? Grandma clothing, Elliot programming. Marusk is the name. Yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting tired. Just like watching. I don't know if people can sit in front of a screen for so long. Jesus. <sighs> Am I just backtracking at this point? I forget. Okay, so if I go here. Oh, this, n this seems new. Okay, that's grandma clothing. Let's see what grandma got. Hmm. All right, so if I get that electric cable, I could uh, get a poncho. Poncho for what, right? Like, what would be the advantage? But I'm just going to keep that in mind. All right, I'm going to keep that in mind for later. What are these bags? Seems creepy, right? Because we have those like, all that like flesh or whatever. Ooh, now it's in. Should I go in? Who is this guy? He's gonna help me. Interesting. Right, so as long as I know that I'm not trapped. Is is this the guy that uh by the elevator? Me. All right. Let's see. Oh, that's clever. So, like, yeah, the, the way that you could get people to open doors for you is you scratch at it, right? I mean, well, my cat's scratching the door. That certainly gets me to open it up, All right? If it gets too annoying. All right. 44 seconds since the last checkpoint. Let's just finish this because I'm hungry. All right. Um, and I'll, I'll have some other kind of a... Uh, pl uh, another uh, let's play stray um, don't know exactly what next topic is going to be but um, so far what I had these two are were, were pretty good so um, all right so we're we're now at the second part chapters three four and five now as you can see uh, compared to the first parts here all right this is a much more compressed right and the reason why it's compressed is because the more kind of like physical interactions in the text, they're not um, like the philosophy is definitely better than maybe not all the kind of like interpersonal interactions with like other people or whatever, but uh, it's, 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 it's better than, than some of these interactions. So 
uh, chapters three, four, and five, uh, you know, in this kind of a state of dissipation, he's walking around, right, feeling depressed or whatever. And he's kind of like sitting and he's like, uh, at one point he comes across this guy, Simonov, right, which is someone that, um, I forget if it's a colleague or someone he went to school with, but it's, it's someone from his past, right? Right. And, and uh, he hears about this a dinner that's going to happen uh, on behalf of uh, another a mutual acquaintance n named uh, Zverkov. And Zverkov uh, is kind of like somebody that's that's worshipped by his friends, right? And uh, the narrator does not have, you know, any kind of like worshipful feelings towards this guy, right? Which leads to problems later on. But uh, so chapters three, four, and five, what, what they remind me a lot of is what happens early on in Steppenwolf. And again, I, I did do a Steppenwolf uh, video, right? It was a few hours, me and Joe um, were talking about uh, the novel. And in Steppenwolf, uh, uh, Harry Holler ends up coming across uh, one of his colleagues and he gets invited to a dinner. And so he comes over his house later that night uh, to, to dinner, right? His wife is there, that kind of thing. And... Prior, like, to the arrival, uh, Harry sees this, uh, I think, yeah, it's a painting of uh, Goethe. And all these things go through his head, right? All these kinds of, like, rich connections about Goethe and about where he is and about who he is and about who he is himself. Um, that later on in the book, like, they really pay dividends because not only is, like, critical to what happens, like, later on in the scene... But later on in the book, Goethe becomes kind of like a character in and of itself, right? And um, uh, to the extent that he's like critical of this uh, painting of Goethe, it is very re reflective of what's going on in Harry Holler's mind. Like it's a very sophisticated like critique of the painting. It shows you like exactly where his mind is at. But at the same time, it's it's almost a kind of like hypocritical critique right because it's not it's not an objective artistic critique just like the narrator in in notes from underground oftentimes he sort of you know tricks tricks himself into thinking that he has all these objective critiques of this or that but you know neither harry nor the narrator have a truly sort of like you know objective grasp of what's going on around them or what's even what's going on internally right which is often you know the most difficult thing to figure out what's going on um but here it's it's a very kind of prosaic thing right so he's he's walking around he sees a friend he invites himself kind of like you know it seems like they're reluctant to help him uh uh to, to like see him hang out with him whatever uh, but he invites him to himself to this dinner and it's it's very prosaic in the sense that like there's no there's no like memorable lines here right there's nothing here that's uh, like I, I like I didn't like extract any individual pieces like to to like talk about simply because I would just be doing a kind of like you know like like a recap of the plot, right? Whereas like in in Steppenwolf, it being a far more developed novel, right? Uh, much more kind of mature in its treatment of of existential questions and stuff like that. It's it's not just plot driven, right? There's a, there's there's far deeper reasons for this to exist here. We need a reason for uh, the narrator to have like a final break from reality, right? And perhaps this isn't the final break, but it's, it's one of these, uh, you know, maybe it's just the kind of like tone for what will become the final break, which is when he uh, meets the, prosti the prostitute Lisa, right? Um, and so he, he goes to this dinner, right? Uh, he's being made fun of uh, b by the others because uh, he, at, at that point, right, he's still in his you know mid twenties and he's working this job that doesn't pay too well. And because of these facts, like these these uh, old school friends that are doing better than he is, they take it upon themselves to make fun of him. So again, you're made to like empathize with this antihero, and it leads to this kind of like you know set of like drunken rages. Right, he's uh, he's thinking like, should I challenge uh, uh, Zverkov to a to a duel, right? In the same way that he has those fantasies of of uh, challenging that cop to a duel, right? And ultimately, he you know decides like, okay, this time I'm going to stand up for my dignity. I'm going to stand up for myself, and he uh, tracks uh, uh, these uh, uh, these friends down uh, to a brothel. And when he arrives at the brothel, he realizes that hey, look. Um, 
they're ready, you know, with prostitutes. They're not even thinking about me now. And so I, I guess uh, perhaps like alluding to some of the, this like dissipation that he feels and oftentimes experiences, uh, he himself asks to see a prostitute uh, and he uh, uh, sees her. Uh, again, her name is Lisa. And for the next couple of chapters, he just kind of like talks to her in a very kind of a, almost fatherly tone. And he's just, he's chiding her, right? And and I think actually this interaction, the, the interaction with his friends isn't that memorable, but the interaction that he has with Lisa is memorable, not even so much because of like the critiques specifically that he makes of her life or whatever, right? He says like, you're going to, you know, what do you, why are you doing this, right? You're going to die eventually. You're going to have a, a very young death. Um, you're going to be totally disconnected from the world. You're not going to have any utility to the world. You're still young. Why are you here? Blah, blah, blah. But you get the sense, especially when he gets like really personal late, later on. And he says stuff like, you know, there's nothing better than to have like a, a little baby just like suckling on your breast and to be married. And even if you were, you know, to be poor in that situation and have arguments with your husband or wife, just seeing the baby look at you and seeing that love is going to make everything better, right? You will even, you know, feed the baby your own food, even if that means that you will go hungry and you will do it willingly, right? And he keeps saying this to her, but uh, it's very, very clear that everything that he says, maybe not the specifics of like prostitution or whatever, but generally speaking, everything that he says to her is a projection of what he feels about his own life. Granted, he's not a prostitute, so maybe like in his own mind, right, he could kind of trick himself into feeling like, okay, well, I'm above this woman, right? I could look down upon her. I could be critical of her like in, in this setting. But really, he hates himself, doesn't he, right? Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's anybody that the narrator could point to truly when he truly thinks about it that is in any way lower than he himself feels about his own life, right? He feels that low. He feels horrific about himself. And the prostitute is just this kind of, you know, she becomes a kind of like, a, a, um, not even a punching bag because kind of like a mirror, right? He, he just uses her to get out everything that he feels about himself, right? When he says stuff like, granted you know like marriage isn't necessarily the best thing ever and not all marriages are happy but you ought to be married it's much better than this well that's you know that applies to like he like he needs a woman to discipline him to domesticate him right and that's kind of like the funny part like when you when you like listen to like people like jordan peterson talk about literature he always loves to talk about dostoevsky and again like it's it's so unclear to me that he uh, that he even understands a little bit of Dostoevsky, right? Because he says stuff like, you know, like a, a, a like like feminine chaos, or like a, a woman like represents uh, chaotic energy, and yet it's very obvious in this text that of the two characters here, the chaos is within the narrator. It's in his it's in his mind. What he needs is he needs a good woman to spank that ass, right? To sort of, you know, get him out of his own, you know, like funk that he's kind of like permanently in, right? Um, so when he tells her that you need to be married, well, he himself needs to be married. He needs someone to slap him good, right? And then like just artistically, there's there's some like very nice details here. Like he's he's telling her what's going to happen to her life ultimately. And he says, you're going to be, you know, like one of these, uh, I forget the neighborhood, the, some district in St. Petersburg. Um, but he says, like, you know, I, I watch them, you know, uh, you know, bury corpses in this like waterlogged uh, 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 grave. Right. And they're, they're just, you know, they, they're, they're dead, but they have to be buried underwater. And this is all that's left for them. And she, you know, she gets scared. She's like, you know, how do you know this? Right. And he's kind of like. You know, he's uh, 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 he tries to like pretend like he has all this knowledge, but what he admits in the actual narration is, you know, I've never seen this happen, right? I'm just saying it just to say it. And the reason why he's saying it is, you know, again, he's scared, right? He, he is imagining the worst possible outcome for himself. He himself sees, maybe not physically be, becoming more and more kind of like incapacitated over time, although, again, remember how it starts off with that, you know, uh, uh, that pitching, right? My uh, pitching uh, bullet, right? Um, and and uh, he's talking about this liver, right? That that is just like 
you know, like like in pain, which uh, I, I'm not sure actually if a liver, I don't think there's a nerve endings on, on, a, on a liver, but I do think that probably if you, if you do have uh, something wrong with the liver, at least around, right, maybe like the liver is like inflamed or whatever, pushing against other organs, maybe, maybe that's what passes for pain of the liver. Um, but, but, but anyway, uh, so he, you know, he's like sitting around and, and he's telling her all these scary things that he just hates by imagining it happening to him. Right. And, and to the extent that this has like a peak existentialist moment, right. This is, this is existentialism, you know, in writing done well, right. Uh, you want situations like a character being used as a kind of mirror, you want things being said to not be exactly what they seem like, what they sound like, right? Um, and when, when she speaks about this, like, young man that might be in love with her, right, she keeps this kind of, like, letter that uh, he sent to her. And she's constantly kind of, like, keeping it close to herself. And uh, there's a negative reaction to this from the narrator. And it's not even because, like, he feels maybe uh, sexually jealous of, uh, of this other man, it seems like he hates the fact that she has like a, a future that she believes in, even if it's a totally like ridiculous future, even if it's never going to come to pass. The fact that she has a future to believe in, this seems to really set him off. And of course, he never quite says it that way. But just again, reading between the lines, it seems to be exactly that. Um, so he gives her his, his address and he's like, all right, come visit me uh, uh, at some point. And... The fact that he does this, he, he's just more and more scared all of a sudden, right? Because now he's like, all right, she's going to visit me. She's going to see my relationship uh, with this uh, um, uh, with this uh, uh, servant of mine. He, he's going to see how, how little he respects me and the fact that I'm poor. Uh, so he's getting increasingly more and more nervous. And the, the chapter starts out with this like really like nasty treatment that he has of Apollon, uh, his servant where he's like trying to find a pretext to not give him his wages and, and stuff like that. Um, so uh, half of him is scared of being visited, but half of him is also fantasizing about like, you know, is Lisa going to come? You know, could I possibly have some kind of life with her? Right. And he's okay. You know, he's okay with the fantasy. He's okay with this kind of elaborate future, but he is always scared at the moment that um, uh, it, it's about to come to pass. And sure enough, right. Like, you know, Lisa visits, right Lisa visits and he's at the one hand very excited but then suddenly becomes scared again because finally this thing this object of attainment right going back to earlier what he said he has a set of objects that he wishes to attain and he claims it's really the process that's interesting it's not really the attainment so just as he's about to have this attainment he starts to insult her right he's ash he's ashamed enough of of his present state that he starts to insult insult Lisa and it's obvious then that the Crystal Palace, right? It's within him, right? Like all that he's doing is just this like self-justification after self-justification, right? It's it's not um, it, granted it's not logic, but it's it's still a Crystal Palace, right? He's replacing logic with something else, right? Even if it, even if it, even if his own Crystal Palace palace is self-destruction, it is there, right? And ultimately, by the time we hit chapter 10, you know, Lisa's crying and he's like hiding in his room, like looking through a crack, like being like protected by this, like, so not even underground, but like, you know, this uh, metaphorical underground, as it were. Um, he throw he throws like, a, or rather he, I think, gives it into her hand, uh, like a, like a, like a five ruble bill or something, right? Implying that uh, perhaps they had sex and, um... You know, she gets upset and she leaves and she never sees him again, right? So this this chapter in his life, which again, it, it, it could have led to something good, right? But his ennui and his uh, paralysis, right? That is his own crystal palace, right? A as he's trying to escape this thing that he claims he hates the most, the crystal palace, the odd thing is he is so responsive to the crystal palace, that he cannot help but construct a new crystal palace within himself. So uh, here is uh, uh, some of the ending, right? I know I shall be told that this is incredible, but it is incredible to be as spiteful and stupid as I was. It may be added that it was strange I should not love her or at any rate appreciate her love. Why is it strange? 
in the first place. By then, I was incapable of love. For I repeat, with me loving meant tyrannizing and showing my moral superiority. I have never in my life been able to imagine any other sort of love and have nowadays come to the point of sometimes thinking that love really consists in, in the right, freely given by the beloved object to tyrannize over her. Again, this thing, right, going back to my novel, Tinker Toys, everybody has a little Tinker Toy, right, or a set of Tinker Toys, something that they construct as their own little narrative, something that they say controls their life or that they think has some kind of purpose, right? And he has, by that same token, his own crystal palace, right? This this conception of love, it is not, you know, any, you know, to the extent that he has the critique of the crystal palace, this isn't, this isn't any better. In fact, it's obviously a lot worse, right? And so this is uh, the way that, that the final uh, paragraph goes. Even now, so many years later, all this is somehow a very evil memory. I have many evil memories now, but hadn't I better end my notes here? I believe I made, made a mistake in beginning to write them. Anyway, I have felt ashamed all the time I've been writing this story. So it's hardly literature so much as a corrective punishment. Why, to tell long stories show how I have spoiled my life through morally rotting in my corner, through lack of fitting environment, through divorce from real life, and rankling spite in my underground world would certainly not be interesting. A novel needs a hero, and all the traits for an anti-hero are expressly gathered together here, and what matters most, it all produces an unpleasant impression. For we are all divorced from life. We are all cripples, every one of us, more or less. So again, think about that concept of Tinker Toys. Think about the concept of the Crystal Palace, right? He He's constructing not only a crystal, but he's constructing around himself, right? Around his own head, right? So he doesn't have to feel, so he doesn't have to act. We are so divorced from it that we feel at once a sort of loathing for real life and so cannot bear to be reminded of it. Why, we have come almost to looking upon real life as an effort, almost as, as hard work. And we are all privately agreed that it is better in books. And why do we fuss and fume sometimes? Why are we perverse and ask for something else? We don't know what ourselves. Know what living means now, what it is, what it is called. Leave us alone without books and we shall be lost and in confusion at once. We shall not know what to join on to, what to cling to, what to love and what to hate, what to respect and what to despise. We are oppressed at being men, men with a real individual body and blood. We are ashamed of it. We think it a disgrace and try to contrive to be some sort of impossible, generalized man. We are stillborn and for generations past have been begotten, not by living fathers, and that suits us better and better. We are developing a taste for it. Soon we shall contrive to be born somehow from an idea. But enough. I don't want to write more from underground. Right? So, I mean, a few things. Like, there's that kind of, like, Nietzschean concept of, uh, you know, you, you have to experience life. You have to affirm life. It needs to be uh, part of a kind of, like, more complex retinue of, of affirmations. Right? We have that part. Um, uh, and... Uh, uh, but but also like there's also the Nietzschean idea of uh, you know he does say stuff like oh you know people rue the uh, advent of religious wars but uh, in my sense right this is Nietzsche speaking um, the advent of religious wars means that finally human beings are, are starting to take ideas seriously now maybe you go too far in the other direction right which is uh, perhaps what this is uh, claiming, but uh, you know it could be responding to that idea too, right? Um, and you know I, I do love uh, that that penultimate line. Soon we shall contrive, right? Contrive, right? This is uh, you know there's something dishonest about it, right? There's an, ar an artificiality there, right? Soon we shall contrive to be born somehow from an idea, and I, you know and I do think we are kind of heading in that direction. You know, I, my, my life is very much, uh, uh, or at least somewhat about that, right? Um, I was speaking the earlier stream as we were playing how uh, I discovered books early on, right? And how I decided that my peers would not be my living, breathing peers and friends around me. It would either be the people in books or it would be people yet to be born, right? 
speaking to another audience, um, speaking to those that deserve me, right, in, in that kind of sense, right? Soon we shall contrive to be born somehow from an idea, but enough. I don't want to write more from underground, right? And, and the question of why, like, why doesn't he want to write anymore? Is it because he feels uh, now that, you know, he, he begins by kind of like tricking himself that this is going to be purely a self-indulgence. And now he's kind of like arguing, well, is this even useful to anybody? Is this really just for me? Um, but if he, and that's the thing, like he does ultimately say this is going to be just for me. And as he seems to have convinced himself of this fact, right, he says that he, he's done, right? He's not going to write anymore, right? Um, so he does feel, again, that he wants that utility, right? He wants something useful to happen from him, from his hands into the hands of the world, right? As much as he, you know, uh, butts against it, as much as he feels that this is a kind of like undeserving part of uh, the Crystal Palace, uh, he, he, he can't escape that. Nobody can, again, like you can't escape, you know, the sort of arts of, uh, of the social contract. It's there, right? Now you, you could act however, you could act how he acts, right? That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, right? Because, because th th this is ultimately the result, right? Of, of pretending that it doesn't exist or pretending that it doesn't matter, right or pretending that that you have options in life when really you know um the options that you do have in life are much more limited than people assume and i mean this in the kind of moral sense i i, I mean like even even if you're like a a billionaire that doesn't have to ever work again even in that situation you don't actually have options in life right you have a set of odds you may again you may not fulfill those odds you may ignore them but you have them you don't have the options that you think you do and lots of people, right, they, they do, you know, they do want to uh, wrestle with it. To the extent that anybody watching this has a gaming addiction, right, maybe you do feel, like, I remember, like, uh, back, you know, back in the day, it would be this kind of, like, feeling in my head of, um, well, look, like, you know, if I, if I ever, like, give up playing video games, uh, what will I have? Like, will I have, like, something little, like, something to look forward to? Some little thing that's going to kind of, like, get me going, get me thinking, get me, you know, uh, like just like something to look forward to, right? And, you know, a, a lot of people, uh, they, they, they feel that way about their own lives, about the addictions that they have, that they need, they need something, right? And I mean, there's nothing wrong with needing something. I need something, I want something, and I, I hit upon those things all the time. Right. But like I said earlier, you know, I haven't even played this game since the uh, last time that I did did this video uh, two weeks ago. Right. Haven't opened up Steam since. Right. It just doesn't, you know, the, these things just don't they don't have that pull on me anymore. Right. Because I saw the purpose. I saw the aughts. Uh, I didn't want to turn away from them any longer. Not that, you know, I, 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 I haven't, you know, uh, ever like not i mean all the time right you're always like turning away from some set of aughts to the extent that you are uh part of that um you know niche and thought experiment of that demon right imagine you have a demon that tells you everything that you've experienced thus far in life every second everything that has ever happened to you you are damned to experience forevermore again and again and again and again from second to second to now right? What kind of person could actually respond to that positively, right? The only person that could do that is the person that is satisfied with their life, with their choices, and with the fact that, yes, I don't have options in life, and I did the only thing that I was supposed to do, right? This is the only person that in the Nietzschean thought experiment um, could come out of it, you know, uh, feeling positively about this prospect, Right. So anyway, I hope this has been in some way helpful. Right. If uh, we do got some addicts, young or old watching this, you know, maybe uh, this will encourage you to check out what else is in this channel. What else is on uh, on the website? Um, again, website is automachination.com. The Patreon is patreon.com slash automachination. I'm going to have uh, a, a few more public videos this week. I'm going to have a, a video on uh, Matthew Iglesias and climate change and how he's uh, um, 
you know, he's, he's very slippery about this question, let's put it that way, and about the recent uh, uh, Biden bill, the, the Deficit uh, Reduction Act, um, or rather the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, on Friday, I'm recording with Jessica Schneider. We're going to be talking about the uh, uh, the Richard uh, Linklater trilogy, uh, the Sunset trilogy, Sunrise, uh, whatever. I mean, like, what would you even call it? Before, because not everything's before, or is it? Or is everything before? Yeah, before midnight, before sunrise. Yeah, before. So the before trilogy, let's call it. So we're going to be talking about that, and we're going to have um, a, a conversation that is going to be patrons only. So again, we're going to keep churning out patron only content. Only way to get that, of course is patreon.com slash automachination. Thank you as always for watching and I'll see you again soon.